for the first time in about two weeks, it's actually sunny here in Massachusetts, which is absolutely fantastic, because for those of you who don't know, I am a lot like grass. I do best in direct sunlight, and I am in your front yard right now. And so with this renewed energy, it is my great pleasure to present to you another episode of Awful Archaeology, the show where I spin this wheel, which is completely covered in archaeological-based conspiracy theories, and I will talk in-depth about whatever it lands on. So if you like weird niche information that you'll never need and the illusion of choice, you came to the right place. For those of you who watched last episode, you will know that today we are going to be talking about the Grave Creek Stone. I'm spinning this wheel in post, so I actually have no idea what my next video is gonna be on. Together, you and I are going to be exploring every facet of this mysterious artifact. From the circumstances of its discovery, to deciphering the mysterious characters written on it, to how it was unfortunately used by early anthropologists whose field was, at the time, almost inseparably linked to white supremacy. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let's get into talking about I took that transition break to do a little bit of hairstyling. 800 years ago, the land stretching between what is now West Virginia, Kentucky, Ohio, and Pennsylvania was populated by a group which today we know as the Adena. The Adena civilization first arose between 1000 and 800 BCE, and it existed all the way until about 2 to 300 CE, meaning that for about a thousand years, the Adena culture predominated Eastern North America. The Adena were a mound building civilization, which means that they built mounds. They built mounds like this mound, and this mound, which due to its relevancy in this story is not just a mound, it is This is the Grave Creek Mound, located in Moundsville, West Virginia. You just can't make this up. Moundsville? God, this is a pretty great place to found a city. What should we call it? I don't know, man. Oh, I got a great idea. It was constructed over a hundred year span between 250 BCE to about 150 BCE. And it is the largest of the Adena mounds. And when I say large, I don't just mean bigger than average, I mean large. The Grave Creek Mound is constructed out of nearly 60,000 tons of sand and dirt. Core samples taken from within the mound in the 1970s have proven that the mound was created over the course of about 100 years by piling the soil higher and higher from baskets. So next time you feel like Arnold Schwarzenegger for taking your groceries out of the car in one trip, just remember you would have got your shit rocked by these people. And as if the height of the mound was not impressive enough, the Adena people decided to take it one step further because apparently they hadn't made enough work for themselves already. All right guys, planning committee. What does this giant hill that we just made need? A uh, river. They dug a 40 foot wide, five foot deep moat around the entire thing. It's enormous. It's it's huge. I'd assume that's probably where most of the dirt came from that they put on top of it as well. That would make sense, wouldn't it? Well, today that moat is all but gone, there is evidence to suggest that there was a causeway which led to the base of the structure across the moat. Today, archaeologists are still baffled as to how this project was cleared without first calling DigSafe. This episode is sponsored by DigSafe. Can you imagine that? This episode is sponsored by DigSafe. You can get in touch with DigSafe by dialing 811 on your cellular device right now. Cellular. Yeah, family, I'm kind of moving up in the world. I got a sponsorship from Dig safe. <laughs> No, but seriously, someone please sponsor me. While the full purpose of the Adena mounds are not entirely known, we do know that part of their purpose were burial structures. This was determined by the fact that there are people buried in them. Don't need to be an archaeologist to figure that one out, do ya? What do you think that thing's used for? There's a guy in it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the whole bit. But there's reason to believe that these mounds were more than just a burial structure. Some think that they had to do with delineating territory, or perhaps they were places of worship, or even some sort of residence. But the problem is a lot of what we know about the Adena Mounds has been lost. The Grave Creek Mound is actually surrounded by many smaller mounds. So let's have a look at those. Oh wait, you can't, because almost every single one of them was plowed in the early 1800s by farmers who wanted to make room for more land. Oh, and as if to make things just a little bit better, uh, the Grave Creek Mound, the crown jewel of the Adena civilization, is today across the street from a prison. And if that doesn't sum up America in one city block, I don't know what does. Now you got your context, you know what the mound's all about, so it's time to finally talk about the year is 1838 and two 
amateur archaeologists named Thomas Biggs and Abelard Thomason decide to dig into the Grave Creek Mound. This is a little move which some like to call archaeology, and I like to call grave robbing. In the mound, they discovered countless artifacts, including thousands of beads, pottery, as well as human remains in two timber-lined burial vaults. Now, allegedly, as the story goes, in the upper of the two burial vaults, within two feet of the human remains found there, they discovered this small sandstone disc. Some eyewitness accounts say that the stone was found clutched in the skeletal hands of the remains in the tomb. And there's even some disagreement on who the first one to find it actually was. But by and large, the consensus seems to state that it was found in context in this particular chamber. Now, when I say this artifact is small, I don't just mean below average, I mean small. The Grave Creek Stone measures about 1.8 inches long and about an inch and a half high, which is a perfect setup for a joke that I'm not gonna make because I am a professional. The Grave Creek Stone raised eyebrows almost immediately. It bore 23 characters, which were interpreted at the time as as some sort of alphabet, which if proven true would have been a groundbreaking discovery. Because as it stands right now, there is no concrete evidence of written language in pre-Columbian North America. So this find held the potential to be quite literally the next Rosetta Stone. But since it's the only one of its kind, it drew a lot of scrutiny. In 1847, archeologist and journalist E.G. Squire noted that the stone had not been published in the day-to-day -day findings. The first-hand accounts of the excavation by Dr. James W. Clemens did not even mention the discovery of the stone in situ. However, Wills de Haas, the author of Early Settlement and the Indian Wars of Eastern Virginia, went on to analyze this claim a little further. And he found that Clemens had noted the discovery of the stone in his day-to-day -day log, but for some reason had not published it, which is a little bit odd that he would omit such a monumental discovery, especially when he was publishing it in something like this. And I want you to keep this book in mind because I will be talking about it again later. But that'll be the really hard hitting part of this episode. We'll keep it light for now. The stone stayed with Squire until he partnered with a physician by the name of Davis. The two racked their brains for a creative name for their archeological firm and named it Squire and Davis Archeological Firm. Squire and Davis were actually pretty monumental in early American archeology not only did they write one of the first academic papers for the only two-year-old Smithsonian Institution, but they also excavated nearly 300 sites in Ohio. Which is amazing, because there's not even 300 interesting things in Ohio. In 1868, the Squire and Davis archaeological firm sold the Grave Creek Stone to the Blackmore Museum, along with a whole bunch of other stuff, because early American archaeologists treated indigenous artifacts like Pokemon cards. Fun fact, they actually had to institute NAGPRA in order to tell people People that indigenous remains were actually human remains and that you couldn't just trade them like broken pieces of pottery. Seriously, grave robbing in the US got so bad that they literally had to pull out a separate law to remind them they were handling human remains. Thank God we've changed so much since then. Squire and Davis would keep a plaster cast of the Grave Creek Stone and then trade the original Grave Creek Stone to the Blackmore Museum, which is now part of the British Museum. But unfortunately, it doesn't matter what they are now because they lost the stone. But thankfully for this story, there were copies made. By 1876, there were several different copies of the original. There were six drawings, four, four, four plaster casts, one wax cast, and one photo which had been cropped from a larger photo of item 60 through 65 of the Squire and Davis archaeological firm. Having reproductions of a lost artifact is great, but it also can raise some problems. Charles Whittlesley, not the one from the Lost Battalion, this one, the other one, said, quote, it has undergone so many changes from transcribers to translators that its value to ethnologists is gone. This is widely believed to be the most accurate depiction of the Grave Creek Stone. This is the Seth Eastman drawing, which was included in the 1850 book by Henry Schoolcraft in Indian tribes of the United States. So now that we know what the stone is, I know you're all dying to know what it means. So let's get into the really confusing part of this. It's time to talk about it. There have been countless interpretations as to what this stone could mean, most of them revolving around it being an alphabet, because it kind of looks like an alphabet. But the fact that there are so many interpretations comes to work against the authenticity of the stone, because each interpretation is wildly different and many horribly biased. A large bias that we need to acknowledge right off the bat is that many of the translators or attempted translators were familiar with languages that met, bleh, were familiar with languages that read left to right. Those lines that many have interpreted as being left to right could also delineate 
28 columns if you flip it on their side. We don't even know which side is up. Hell, that little sigil on the bottom could say you're reading this upside down, dumbass. In 1930, a man named Andrew Price claimed to have cracked the code. In an article he published to Science Newsletter, he claimed that the stone was written in good old West Virginian, or plain English. But I've never actually been to West Virginia, so I don't know if they speak English there. Fact check, what language do they speak in West Virginia? Drop a comment below. Price claimed that the stone read in plain English, Bill Stump Stone, October 14th, 1838. That was it. That was the genuine conclusion he came to, was that that is English. Now, he claimed that this must be a reference to Charles Dickens' Pickwick Papers, which had been published a year before the excavation. And in Dickens' work, there is a stone with almost this exact same inscription on it. So he thought that this was, like, a reference to it or something, done as a practical joke. But this interpretation is just god-awful. Because not a single one of those characters looks remotely like what he says they do. I theorized the way that Price came to this conclusion was by closing one eye, closing the other eye, and then taking out a copy of Charles Dickens' The Pickwick Chronicles and reading that instead. In 1976, Barry Fell, the author of BC America, claimed to have deciphered the entire text, and that it read from left to right, the mound raised from Tosh, this tile, queen to be made, and that it was written in Iberian script Punic. Now, how exactly does Fell go on to support his claim that a Mediterranean language found its way to West Virginia? His claim is actually fairly good, so we'll hear him out for this. Fell said that when the stone was discovered, Iberian script was known about, but no one had deciphered it yet. So by his logic, no one would have been able to forge an almost complete sentence with a script that no one knew how to speak, meaning that it couldn't be fake. Couldn't possibly. There's no way it could be fake. However, in 1998, Reverend Edward Smith Jr. said that this couldn't be the case because... Get this, it's not Iberian script Punic. And goes on to say, quite honestly, we don't know what the Grave Creek Stone says, only what it does not say. Some of you may be familiar with Aram on TikTok. I was gonna say his full name, but Aram, buddy, that last name is an absolute nightmare. I'm, I'm not doing that. He's incredibly knowledgeable about ancient languages, so I decided who best to consult about this stone than him. And he pretty much backed up what Reverend Edward Smith Jr. said, which is that this is definitely not Iberian script Punic. And furthermore, that he has no idea what it is. And I was like, like, thank God for that, because if he did know what it was, then I would probably have to redo this entire video. <coughs> I'm allergic to you, Aram. Anyway, thanks very much for your help, Aram. I couldn't have done it without you, and I figured the least I can do is give you a shout-out, because you did ask me so nicely. Wait, you son of a- Regardless of his controversy, this interpretation has actually found its way into the Grave Creek Mound Museum. So here are my thoughts on this interpretation. What is post-Carthaginian Iberian script doing in West Virginia? To get from the Iberian Peninsula to the West Virginia-Ohio border, you have to cross not only the entire Atlantic Ocean, but you also have to cross 300 miles of forested hills. And then, once you get where you're going, you have to tolerate being near Ohio. So, for for a second, let's assume that this is Iberian script Punic. Are we then meant to believe that there would not be any other examples of it that have been found? Some of you may justly bring up my own words against me and mention the fact that I said earlier that many indigenous sites were destroyed during Manifest Destiny. Regardless, you would think that if someone came across the ocean and taught a group of people how to write, they probably would have been like, damn. That's pretty useful. So while yes, this is a possibility, I think it is highly unlikely and would need a lot more foundation to back it up. Here's a quick speed run of all the different languages that Mr. Schoolcraft thought were on this stone. 16 Celtic Iberian, 14 Old British, 10 Phoenician, 7 Old Erse, 6 Gaelic, 5 Runic, 4 Etruscan, 4 Greek, and a partridge in a pear tree. In 1991, Stephen Williams made a claim in Fantastic Archaeology that the Grave Creek stone was entirely faked. In his eyes, the the fact that all of the glyphs on the stone were fairly easily recognizable was a testament to the fact that it was entirely fabricated. But he was not the first person to come up with this hypothesis, and it was actually tested years earlier by a man named Reed. And Reed published his findings in this article entitled The Stones of Grave Creek. Now, he also thought this was a forgery, but he decided to do an experiment to test it. His experiment is as follows. He asked four different people who, quote, had never seen the inscriptions to write down 20 or more arbitrary characters not resembling any figures or alphabetical characters known to them and composed of straight lines or combinations of straight lines. He asked four different people to complete this task. I don't know what a druggist is, but I'm gonna assume that it's like a, a cultist on drugs. 
Like these guys from Far Cry. Ha, ah, joke's on you. I know it's an old-fashioned word for pharmacist. Please don't tell me it in the comments because I know someone already started typing it. Reed was looking for familiar characters which appeared in the Grave Creek text. These characters are, quote, a cross found twice, an X, a diamond, an hourglass, the capital D with a line which makes it represent a bow and arrow, and the figure four, the latter exactly representing our printed figure. This much is evident that the inscription is not necessarily alphabetic. Now, as a scientist, I believe that any experiment that is to be given any bit of credibility must be able to be replicated. So I decided to replicate his experiment. I asked my viewers Reed's question verbatim, and this is what they came up with. Now, there are a couple things I changed, so I want to acknowledge that bias first, but I think you'll see why I did it if you bear with me. Firstly, I combined his cross and X into the same category. Because, as I mentioned earlier, we don't know which side is up on the Grave Creek Stone. Meaning that it could have been read top to bottom, left to right, or hell, even diagonal. We have no idea which side is up. Assuming it's even real. Another thing to note is that while my audience all have vastly different artistic styles, they all have one commonality. And that is that they all watch me. So they're all here for the exact same reason. Which is archaeology and history and all that. So these people are prepared to go above and beyond to try and come up with their own languages. And some people took it very, very seriously. So it is worth noting that there may have been extra effort put in here to make the most unique characters possible. That being said, let's move on to the results. If we combine the pluses and crosses on the Grave Creek Stone, we have a grand total of three. Reed's sample group had a grand total of six X's and crosses. Seven of my 11 participants made crosses, and among those seven, they made ten crosses. And of these seven, one person made two crosses, another person made three crosses, and two groups independently made the same symbol not once, but twice, which is just amazing. In his sample group, not a single person drew a diamond. However, in my sample group, three out of the 11 people ended up drawing diamonds. One person made four diamonds, and two people independently came up with the exact same character. The hourglass was also a little bit dodgy, where one person came up with an hourglass in Reed's study, and three people came up with hourglasses in mine. And of course, you got that one person who decided to just make an hourglass twice. Capital D with an arrow. This was the most bizarre character he could have picked for this. I don't know why he was like, oh yeah, that's a recognizable character everyone knows. Maybe there's two of them? These are the two that resemble what he's describing the most out of my sample size. I don't know what he means by this, so I, I really can't give you much substantial evidence on this side. Another one of his criteria was the number four. The number four appeared four times in a sample size of four, whereas with me, only three of my participants made fours, and one person did it three times. Did two of them, but did one of them upside down and thought I wouldn't notice. I don't think that any of my viewers did a bunch of digging to try and figure out why I was asking them this question, but I decided that in the off chance they were, I needed to add another factor so that they wouldn't get wise to it and then purposely rig their results. So I added one new character to Reed's initial experiment, and that is the line. The line appears in the Grave Creek inscription once, and it's pretty much present in every language that involves straight lines. In my focal group, it appeared five times, and it also appeared twice on the same sheet. Although again, they added a couple little things around it and thought I wouldn't notice. I would say that these findings are significant enough to suggest that there is a possibility that this was all just made up. And the reason why so many people are interpreting it as so many different languages is because it carries symbols from so many different languages, which is just indicative of the fact that you can only make so many symbols. But this methodology was not loved by all. In fact, David Kelly himself actually dug into Williams and Reed's claims pretty hard. Kelly is a pretty big name and is responsible for helping decipher the Mayan glyphs in South America. As an epigrapher, Kelly's input is quite valuable here. Kelly interpreted this carving as being alphabetic, and considering that he just helped decipher an entire script, which was phonetic, I'd hazard a guess that he actually knows what he's talking about. But when he goes on to talk about Reed's claim, he goes really hard. This this is what he says about Reed's experiment, and also about my experiment. Sorry, Kelly, you must be rolling in your grave that I did it again. Quote, this rubbish is utterly irrelevant to the question of alphabets. If one can match an inscription to a scientific alphabet or even to a closely related group, group of alphabets, it is alphabetic. Otherwise, it is not. Inventing imaginary systems by people familiar with alphabets seems to have been a useful propaganda device, but such systems do not support Reed's conclusion that any of the laborers could have invented such an inscription. Bah humbug, Mr. Reed. So if you thought archaeologists didn't know how to roast one another, may you stand corrected. Kelly continues, My major point, however, is not to argue that the inscriptions are indeed genuine, but rather that I do not find it fantastic to think that they may be. And he finishes with, William's book should not be used as 
as a bludgeon against looking at important but unusual data and trying to put such data in a genuinely appropriate archaeological context. I absolutely love what Kelly has to say here, and I would be a fool to act like I know the topic of linguistics anywhere as thoroughly as he does. And I'm a big fan of his addition in there about not just writing off finds because they don't align with what you understand, which is something that I hope I don't give off. I like to think I give these things a little bit of a chance before I write them off. <laughs> But in rebuttal of Kelly's deduction, I say this. Where are the other instances of this script? Because as someone who just deciphered an entire language, you would know that language is prolific. So surely if this were a credible source, we would have found another one. So in the most respectful way, Kelly, wherever you are, Bah humbug. And then of course there's like the batshit crazy conspiracy people who get involved with this. There's Freeborn, the guy who wrote The Deep Mystery, The Day the Poles Moved, and he said the stone depicts coordinates. Have a look at that. Is that not just the most red string corkboard missing persons cardboard cutout thing you've ever seen in your entire life? Take a look at this! Jesus Christ! This looks like what would happen if you input the word conspiracy into an image creating AI. And on top of this, he uses ley lines between the Grave Creek site and the Miami's, Miamisburg? Yeah, the Miamisburg Mound in Dayton, Ohio, which is pretty much like, oh look, I drew a line between two locations. They must be related to one another. And then it gets even more insane. He claims that this has some similarity to the Curbstone 86, which is part of a megalithic site, like a Irish megalithic site, I believe. And it has similarities to the Georgia Metcalf Stone, which, you ready for this, is also on the Wheel of Pain. Woo, pseudo-archaeology citing pseudo-archaeology. You've lost your mind. You've lost your goddamn mind, Charlie. As you can see, people have a difficult time agreeing on this stone. But I suppose you are all here for some sort of answer. So whether you like it or not, I'm about to give you I believe that Clemens fabricated the stone. Clemens had sunk a ton of money into the excavation of this site and needed something to make it back. I believe that the stone was made and planted at the site in order to generate controversy and therefore be able to make back some of the capital which was spent on excavating the site. Now, how do I back this up? Because there's a lot of people who think that this is authentic. Here are my list of reasons why I think this is fake. One, nobody can agree on what language it is. Now that does leave the possibility that it is a newly discovered language, and I'm not ruling that out. But I'm saying as it stands right now, this stone which has been known about for nearly 200 years still has no explanation behind it. Which I guess smoothly segues me into point number two, which is that if this was a living active language in the past 200 years, we would have found another one of these stones. I'm saying that almost without a shadow of a doubt, we would have found one. And three, every single explanation for where this language came from insists that it came from Europe. And there is no way in my eyes that there were Mediterranean Europeans in Ohio 2,000 years ago. Because if there was, there would be a lot more evidence for it. And that third point segues me into the final part of this. Funny time's over because now we have to talk about- I am a firm believer that one cannot talk about archaeology in North America without acknowledging that in its inception, it was almost entirely not done in good faith. There were reputable archaeological firms like Squire and Davis, whom I mentioned earlier, and even Thomas Jefferson, who some would argue would be the father of American archaeology. But it's the little examples like this which are talked about so much that they completely overshadow the sinister underbelly of early archaeology in the United States. And that is that it wasn't archaeology. It was grave robbing. There are no two ways around it. Archaeology, when done without adherence to the scientific process, without adequately categorizing finds, and without any respect for the site at which you are digging, is not archaeology, it's a crime. And when these grave robbers had completed their task of liberating everything from jewelry to human remains from the burial centers of indigenous people, they didn't categorize their finds, they didn't itemize them and put them in museums and submit them for review and study. They sold them, and selling them wasn't even the worst of it. The worst of it was that many of these discoveries were used to back up and support a new emerging evil known as scientific racism. The idea that certain groups of people in the world are genetically dispositioned to be inferior. The idea that white Europeans were somehow more advanced than the rest of the world. And the misconception that other places with different cultural practices were in reality not different, they were just primitive and savage. It was a sort of justification that came at this interesting time 
where it was an intersection between an old way of thinking, tradition, and a new way of thinking of science, where the two were battling it out, trying to find a way to reckon with one another. This book, which I told you to remember earlier, was where many of the findings from the Grave Creek excavation were published, and the contents within it are fucking horrifying. Crania Americana solidified its place in the world of anthropology due to its unbelievable illustrations. The entire thing is full of pictures of skulls of indigenous people from both North and South America, and the prints are captivating even today. These prints were not carved into wood, but into limestone, which allowed the printer to give texture to the skull. While this is a stroke of artistic genius, it also did work to back up the racist intentions of the book. People in Europe took this to mean that the indigenous people in the New World had a different texture bone and were therefore softer and weaker than their European counterparts. Not only this, but of course the shape and size of skulls was analyzed beyond belief. The idea of cranial volume and how it relates to race and origin and region in the world was like the bread and butter for these early scientific racists. For any of you who've seen Django Unchained and were horrified at the scene in which Calvin Candy smashes the skull of old Ben, that is in reality how a lot of these people thought. While Calvin Candy is obviously a horrible racist slave owner, you'll notice in that scene that he is trying to use science to back up his backwards and twisted ways, which is truly what is at the core of scientific racism. It was justification for a way in which these people already thought. The skulls depicted in this publication were also collected in horrible ways, not only through grave robbing of both active and unused indigenous sites, but also like in the case of this seminal warrior, off of the battlefield, and the dime-sized hole in the side of this individual's skull is not from the seminal wars, as they claim, but in a desperate struggle to defend one's homeland. Scientific racism was the seed that, when watered with the do-no-evil misconception of science, would later go on to sprout into eugenics. There is a reason why, when doing research for this video, I did not come across any articles talking about how the Grave Creek Stone may have been the Adena language. And laying aside the fact that I think the stone is fake, you would think that with so many interpretations and so many people believing that it is genuine, there would be one person who thought that maybe the indigenous people came up with this. But what you do see is countless interpretations of what European language could it be. From Old Erse to Celtic Iberian to Punic to English, every single interpretation of this stone was deduced by looking through a European lens. The fact that almost everyone who tried to read this stone read it left to right is a testament to that. I'm a firm believer that when telling the story of early American archaeology, it is our obligation to remind the world what its intentions were. Regardless of how long ago it happened, or who it directly affects now, the butterfly effect of the ideologies of the people who conducted this excavation is still present all around the world today. And that is why we must tackle misinformation. That is why we should nip conspiracy in the bud. That is why it is your obligation as a citizen of this planet to educate those around you. Because when left unchecked, the unassuming sprout of conspiracy will grow into a vine that will choke out the tree of truth. Wow, I am sorry to end this on such a downer. Before I let you go, let's have a look at what next video is going to be on. Wow. I am, again, spinning this wheel after I have recorded this, so I have no idea what my next video is going to be on. But let's hope it is more cheery than this one. I've gotten a handful of submissions and some requests to do a fan art section as well. So I decided this is going to be the first fan art section I did. I never thought I'd be saying that. I think I can take my hair down now. This beautiful masterpiece was created by a viewer who uses the online name Lazarus. Thank you, Lazarus. That's really good. I don't know how you did that. And finally, people really ran with my stupid state map from last episode. And my viewer Varg uh, came up with this. <laughs> which is the flag for the stupid state. <laughs> this had me in absolute hysterics when that episode was done, so thanks for that, Varg. As always, I try and do live premieres with these videos, so if you were here for this one, it was wonderful having you, and if you weren't, I look forward to seeing you next time. If you like this video, subscribe and hit the notification button so you can be there when the next premiere happens. I'd like to thank my patrons for making this video possible. My patrons get early ad-free access to my videos, and your names will be in the credits if you're one of those, so stick around for that. Remember to stay curious, stay inquisitive, and most importantly, remember to stand for the truth. <laughs>